Well, look, it's it's uh, it's in our interest in America to support Israel. Uh, it's in our national interests. Um, David uh, Glawi, who's our Undersecretary of Homeland Security, spoke at the uh, most recent 9-11 memorial in Jerusalem, one of the most beautiful 9-11 memorials anywhere in the world. And he said something that didn't get uh, picked up that, uh, that extensively, so I'm going to repeat it here. He said, uh, uh, Israel keeps America safe. Uh, and that's, uh, that's very true. And it's a, hard, it's a hard thing to really go into detail or to advertise, but it's true. Um, for generations, the American support for Israel was very much, it came from the heart, and, and it still does. It comes from my heart. It comes from the heart of almost everybody I work with in the White House. It comes from the hearts of millions and millions of Americans. But uh, over the last uh, five to ten years, I would say it also comes from the head. Uh, we are, uh, without question, better off when Israel is strong uh, and secure uh, and stable and prosperous. So it is very much an American interest to, uh, to support Israel in all ways. Uh, and uh, understand that the, when we approach uh, the president's vision for peace and prosperity, we begin with, with that foundational principle. Um, we support Israel in many, many, many ways. Uh, well, one of which, of course, is in the geopolitical world, but it's not the only way. And uh, maybe at an, on another occasion, we can talk about all the other ways that have nothing to do with uh, the region or the maps or anything else where uh, Israel and the United States work together. But we'll talk today about geopolitical uh, issues and about what we've done. When we, uh, when we got into office, um, couldn't help but notice that uh, 52 years after the Six Day War, uh, many of the issues were, were still out there and lingering and very little had been done upon them. There had been a, a treaty with Egypt and uh, return of the Sinai, there had been a peace treaty with, with Jordan, but the, the thorniest issues, Jerusalem, Golan Heights, uh, Yudav Shamron, were still, uh, completely up in the air, uh, with no particular um, international consensus, and certainly with no uh, positions expressed by our predecessors that get, gave Israel any, any hope of any uh, progress. And so we did tackle them. We tackled them uh, one by one. We, we uh, first looked at Jerusalem. It was perhaps the easiest because there had been a law in the books for the past uh, 25 years that compelled the United States to recognize Jerusalem as the undivided capital of Israel, and yet uh, no president had seen fit to take any action on it. We, we did. The president made a commitment, and we, and we uh, proceeded with that. With regard to the, uh, the Golan Heights, um, uh, given the uh, en enormous threats that uh, Syria represented and the, 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 the competing claims, if you will, between the democratic uh, state of Israel, an important American ally, and the brutal regime of uh, Bashar Assad, it didn't seem like a close call in terms of the competing rights, and we, we moved in that direction. Uh, we, we'd been working for, for years on the issue of settlements, not on, not on a policy issue, but just trying to really understand um, the legal claims and the legal arguments, uh, because whenever we talked about it, uh, whenever I talked about it, certainly somebody would push back from the media and say, well, the whole world recognizes that settlements are illegal, they violate international law. I was skeptical about that proposition, but I, I didn't think it mattered what I said. I thought it really would mattered what the uh, what the United States said as a uh, as a body, as uh, as the State Department, the the representative of American foreign policy. And so we got to work on that, and it took took longer. But uh, after a very thorough analysis, uh, Secretary Pompeo concluded that settlements were not uh, violative of uh, international law. So we put all that together and said, okay, now how do you take all those things and you? Uh, and you uh, extrapolate and, and export all those, all that thinking, all the thinking that went behind that into a uh, into a peace plan. And I guess the first question really is, you know, why bother with a peace plan? Uh, what's what's the point? Um, it's easier not to. Frankly, for me, it'd be much easier not to have to uh, not to have to spend uh, what's undoubtedly going to be an enormous amount of time in the future, and it's already been a, a huge amount of time defending it and, and explaining it, and it's complicated. Um, why is it in the interests of the United States and Israel to, to put something out? And I think the, uh, I think the, the answers are, are multifold. The first of which is that it's clearly in Israel's best interest in the long run. Um, these issues aren't going away. They're not hard to ignore because uh, the Palestinians in, in 52 years have done nothing to create 
any type of a political movement that provides Israel with any any sense of uh, of certainty or calm or, or assurances that uh, the Palestinian Palestinians won't be won't be a threat to Israel if they were to achieve statehood. So, Palestinians have made it very easy for Israel to ignore it, um, and um, in, in in many respects, uh, with with some minor skirmishes uh, over the last uh, uh, five decades, that's pretty much what's what's been the the approach. But uh, but the issues are out there. The issues are out there with uh, on college campuses uh, in the United States with the BDS movement with the with uh, the nations around the world uh, raising it constantly, um, with uh, many, uh, as you, you, you guys watch the same political uh, debates and movements that I see on television, you see how uh, not everyone in American politics uh, views the world the way we do. And so the question is, is it possible to design a resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that accomplishes a few important things? Um, number one, that protects Israel's security. First and foremost, protects Israel's security. And I want to take a, I want to stop there for a minute because it's by far the most important issue. Um, we start with, um, we, we look at this issue with a great deal of humility. Uh, humility based upon the fact that we are not smart enough to know what's going to happen in this region tomorrow, a year from now, or 10 years from now. If you look back at, uh, at 1995, when President Clinton was pushing Prime Minister Robin to, to make a deal with somebody, right? First, he's, first the effort, the goal was to make a deal with Syria. And then when that failed, make a deal with Jordan. And then when the Jordanians said, well, we're not going to make a deal with you unless you do something with the Palestinians, he went and Oslo came to be, and then a Jordanian peace treaty came to be. But this all started off with uh, Syria. That was, the, that was the, the preferred course of action. Now think about what would have happened. The entire negotiation was premised upon Israel uh, returning the Golan Heights to Syria. And those negotiations were active, and they were moving forward. And they they might have, you know, with a couple of you know a couple of breaks here and there, they might have proceeded. Now, in 1985, did anybody anticipate that Syria would become what it became in uh, 2015 or 16? Uh, nobody. So imagine looking back today on that decision. Uh, if the Golan Heights had, God forbid, become part of Syria, and people who lived in the uh, uh, in the Upper Galilee or the Lower Galilee, or just you know, uh, we're, we're we're right on the border of the Syrian civil war, and and how many lives would have been lost, and how much danger would have uh, would have resulted to the uh, Israeli people, because they failed to predict something which nobody predicted in 1995. Uh, Syria had been a stable border for many years, maybe the most stable border at that time in 1995. So we start off with the, with the humility that we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, or the next day, or, the follow, or a year or five years from now. Now, with regard to security, we looked at the, at the situation really as, uh, as, as three, three options. Who's going to provide security if there's a future Palestinian state? Choice number one, which had been uh, advocated by many of our predecessors, was an international force. Israel... Uh, for good reasons, could never accept an international force, nor could we. We see what happened in, uh, in Lebanon just uh, uh, 15 years ago or 14 years ago when, um, when there were 10,000 rockets in the arsenal of Hezbollah and uh, the war ended and uh, UN Resolution 1701 came into place and the resolution required that Hezbollah disarm and that disarmament was going to be overseen by, by UNIFIL. The United Nations forces in Lebanon. How did they do? Well, we know how they did. They failed because today um, uh, we know that uh, Hezbollah has 140,000 rockets instead of 10,000 rockets. They're far more dangerous than they were then. The quality of their rockets have gotten better. Um, and so, and we can come up with two or three other examples as well. International forces don't work. Uh, what's the second choice? The second, in, in, uh, let's 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 dispel perhaps the fourth choice immediately, which is that the Palestinians could take care of their own internal and external security. I think even they don't uh, believe that they can. So that one is the easiest one to dispel. So the second choice is that American troops will somehow take responsibility for the security of this new Palestinian state. The simple answer is we're not prepared to do that. The longer answer is that Israel doesn't want it either, because I think the best way to jeopardize the relationship of the United States and Israel is to have American soldiers dying on Israeli soil. One of the, one of the great uh, decisions made by the state of Israel at the beginning of its existence was that Israel would defend itself by itself, would not call 
for American troops, and, and I think that's exactly why this relation has grown and flourished with, with an enormous amount of mutual respect. And so if you just kind of eliminate all those choices, you're left with one, with one choice, which is that the state of Israel will defend this region. They are by far the best equipped to do it. They are by far the best incentivized to do it. And, um, and security is simply not, it's not a game. It's not a political issue. It's not something that uh, you know, is subject to, um, to, to populist sentiment here or there. Security is, is real. It, it's life and death. And uh, from the beginning, we respected Israel's security needs, which I think is the, the primary reason why we were able to move forward in other directions with, uh, with the prime minister and others who we had discussions with. Um, some of the other key points of the plan. Um, we learned from the past with regard to uh, evacuations. Uh, they're inhumane, they don't work, and they would place enormous stress upon the, upon the fabric of uh, Israeli society. Uh, in uh, 2000, was Gaza 2005 or six? I forgot, or 2005. 2005, 8,000 uh, Israelis were living in the Gaza Strip, about as remote from central Israel as you can get. Um, I'd been to Israel at that point, I think, I don't know, maybe 50 times. I think I'd been to Gush Katif once in those 50 times. Um, you would think if there's any place where you could uh, easily uh, evacuate 8,000 people, it would, be, it would be in Gaza. Uh, and it wasn't easy. It was, it was the farthest thing from easy. Uh, I watched those uh, videos of, uh, of soldiers crying with the, with the residents and, and, the, and the enormous strain it took and it, it visited upon the Israeli people. Um, why would we ever want to put Israel through that again, especially on, on, a, on a level of, on a dimension far greater than ever happened in uh, Gaza? I mean, you're talking about the biblical heartland of the state of Israel, and not 8,000 people, but however you slice it, 10, 20, 50, 100,000 people. I mean, it's just, it, it, we can debate, you know, with people on the right and the left, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, whether it's right or wrong, it's just not gonna happen. It's just not something that we would ever expect to happen because we've seen the movie before. We saw the trailer, not the movie, we saw the trailer before. The trailer was pretty ugly. We're not anxious to see the movie. So that's a, um, so we, we, we start with, we use that sort of as a, as a foundational principle. Um, borders. Um, the, the notion that the 1949 armistice lines are anything other than armistice lines. Uh, is something that we, we frankly never understood. You know, what happened in uh, 1949? The, uh, the, uh, Israel's enemies agreed to stop fighting along a certain, along a certain green line with the, um, with the understanding that they, they, they were not recognizing any of Israel's borders to the, um, to the west of, the, of that green line. They were going to rearm, and they were going to uh, take another shot at uh, destroying Israel whenever they felt like it, which they did feel like in 1967 and 1973. So these armistice lines have somehow, had somehow morphed over time to, um, uh, into something, some kind of a natural border, and, and, and we just don't accept that. What we do accept is that, a, um, is that there, are, um, there are several million people living in Judea and Samaria who do not accept Israeli rule or claim not to accept Israeli rule, whose life is, uh, is suboptimal, given the, um, given the challenges of security uh, that exist, uh, and that deserve better. And this is a dispute that both they and Israel would be better off resolving. Uh, not as a matter of legal principles, because there really, there really aren't any that, that, that would end the dispute, but as a basis of direct negotiations where, um, where people's lives can improve and people can live uh, and, and, and achieve aspirations of independence and dignity and prosperity. And that's, the, uh, and that's what we tried to, uh, to design. Um, people, um, I don't think people really understand the, um, uh, the extent of the proposal made by, by Israel. I think the world tends to view it as uh, highly pro-Israel. Um, look, we are, we are instinctively pro-Israel, but, but this, this plan is, and I've said this before, this is not a gift to, uh, to a political leader. This is a gift to Israel. It's a gift to Palestinians. It's a gift to the region. It works for everyone. Um, to the Palestinians, 
they have the opportunity to more than double their their existing footprint in uh, area A and B, the ability to expand Gaza uh, beyond its uh, its existing borders, to to connect Gaza to uh, to Judea and Samaria in a way to create some level of cohesion. Um, there's a, there's a means of uh, traveling you know straight uh, from north to south or east to west. You know there's been references to this as a uh, these are a bunch of cobbled together. Um, Territories. No, there, there, there will be whether it's a bridge, a tunnel, or some other connection. There will be a means of going north to south and east to west, in the same way that you know when I when I used to go to work every day in um, in Manhattan, I used to go from Long Island. I used to go through the Midtown Tunnel. Now, if you tell me that that I'm, that I'm if you tell me that I'm traveling underwater, I'd have no idea. I never saw a drop of water in 35 years of commuting to work because you know that's how that's how tunnels work, and so. You know, from the from the air, how it looks. Who cares? From the ground, it, it will be a, uh, a, 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 a. We have created the, the prospects for a state that has connectivity north, south, and east to west, and I think in a way which is far more advantageous to the Palestinian people than today. Um, but I would not underestimate the um, the the amount of courage it takes to put out a map of a Palestinian state. You know, to those people who say, "Well, you know, it's." Uh, you know, it's not big enough. Or it's, first, it's, it's double the footprint. It's double Gaza. It connects the two. And um, I can tell you plenty of people that saw this map on the Israeli side. When they first saw it, they gasped because what is that that you put there in the middle of Israel? And, um, and, it's, and it's for good reason. For good reason. I mean, this, the Palestinians have made it very, very easy for, for the Israelis to just ignore the prospects of the possibility of a Palestinian state. It's not politically easy to do this. Um, but as I said, um, it's, if, you put, if you create enough of the right structures, and, and there's one, one other point about the structures, and, and, I, and I take to heart General Kupawasser's points, and they're all good points, and they're all points that I think have to be fleshed out further. But um, we've done something here not just for Israel, but for the Palestinians as well when we, when we talk about the conditions to, uh, to statehood. Um, in addition to requiring an end to the pay for slay, as, as General, as you pointed out, or, the, or other malign activity or incitement or, or other uh, activity which is not conducive to, uh, to being a good neighbor, we've also said that um, there needs to be a, a system of laws in place that protects human rights, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, uh, to create a real democratic society. Why? Because at the end of the day, those are the only societies that last. I mean, you know, other societies that you know they they they, they last for for a while, but but they're not they're not good partners in the long run, and um, and for the Palestinian people, they should understand that America stands with them, and what I believe is their desire, a desire that they have a hard time expressing because it's a repressive society, but we stand with them and their desire to achieve a democratic, more prosperous state, and we're not putting our fingerprints on any new state that doesn't have those characteristics. Um, we uh, we think that Israel has gone a long way in agreeing to uh, to a freeze of uh, construction in the territory that this plan uh, allocates in Area C to a Palestinian state. It's a significant commitment. It's it, in exchange for that we've agreed, as as you know, uh, when when we complete this committee process, which the president spoke about, which is getting lots and lots of uh, attention. Um, uh, I would point out just. Parenthetically, uh, right now, that the president put out a plan for the next 100 years, not the next 30 days. I understand the next 30 days people want to talk about it because of the elections, but, but I, I would encourage everyone to take a, st take a step back and a deep breath because this is something that, if done right, uh, can ensure Israel's security and bring great prosperity and dignity to the Palestinians if it's done right and done over the next, um, and again, for the next 100 years. And, and that was our perspective. I, we're not going to get any more involved than we need to be, hopefully not at all in Israeli politics, but, but just that is, that is our perspective on this. Uh, but in any event, this is, um, this is something that I think is correctly structured. Uh, we're very encouraged by the, um, by, by the reactions that, uh, that have been observed by, by the neighbors, by others. Um, um, this will have to take its course. We're, we're not anticipating breakthroughs in the next um, week or two weeks or three weeks. So this is, this is something we, we want to proceed with for the long term. But I think that uh, when the dust settles, um, I hope people 
around the world understand Israel's made a firm offer to more than double the Palestinian territory and to create a Palestinian state uh, on specific terms and specific conditions and specific territorial dimensions. And that, uh, my friends, is an enormous breakthrough that no one has seen over the past 52 years. You can go back through all the great, uh, all the great conferences and summits and agreements, whether it's Oslo, whether it's, uh, whether it's Y, whether it's Geneva, whether it's Madrid, you can go through all of them. I defy anyone to read any of those documents and tell me exactly where the borders of Palestine and Israel begin or end. And you can't. And so this is an enormous step forward. And, and, I, and I congratulate the Israeli government on, on having the courage to, uh, to move forward in this matter. I thank Dory and, and his team for helping us and others who, who were provided us with such great insights as we went along the process. And, uh, and let's just give it time. Give it the time to digest and to understand. And, uh, and, and yes, it is a clear pathway to Israeli sovereignty over, over their biblical heartland. And we're looking forward to, to proceeding uh, with that as we complete this process, which will not be an unduly protracted or long process. Um, but more importantly, I think, is, the, is, the, is, is to demonstrate to the world that Israel is not seeking to, uh, to subjugate another people, that they're prepared to live in peace and dignity with, with, with neighbor, but they're not prepared to commit suicide either. And I think this threads that needle in, 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 in as good a way as we can. It was, a narrow, it was a narrow hole that we had to stick that thread, but I think we threaded it as best we can. And we hope this makes uh, a long-term contribution to the, to the security and the stability of the region. Well, look, first of all, um, yeah, the question, the question is, um, the, the question is, um, if, I, if I can summarize, the question is, uh, what, is, what is the timing of, uh, or, or, the, or the procedures or with regard to Israel applying its laws to the territory that is uh, provided to be part of Israel under the plan, and is the United States preventing Israel from taking any action? Well, first of all, let me say, look, the, the United States can't prevent Israel from doing anything. Israel's a sovereign nation. Israel can do what Israel wants to do, and we, we have no control over Israel uh, in terms of its sovereign actions. But if we're talking about what we understand uh, the uh, agreement to be with the um, with the Israeli government, it's that um, we will begin a process, and that process is literally just about to begin. A six-member committee, three uh, members, uh, three three appointed by Prime Minister Netanyahu and three appointed by President Trump. Uh, I'm not going to give the names of the six members, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you who one of them is. One of them is going to be me, and um, and the. Uh, we, we're, we're going to go through a, uh, the mapping process to convert a map which is drawn at a scale of more than a million to one into, a, uh, into something which, is, which is, uh, um, really shows on the ground how the, uh, how the territory will be, will be put together. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not unduly difficult, but it's also not simple because there's a lot of, uh, there are some judgment calls. Uh, we don't want to do this piecemeal. We think it's a mistake to, you know, to have, uh, you know, Israel uh, make one decision and then we have to react on a second se decision. We, we want to do this once, holistically and in totality, and get it done and get it done right for the benefit of Israel as well. The last thing we want to do is have, you know, have this become highly um, politicized and, you know, why don't you move this here or move that there. We just want to get it done right. It's not too much to ask. And that was the president's message when he, when he spoke about it the first time. A, a committee will be appointed to convert the theoretical map into something uh, specific, following which there would be immediate recognition. Those are the president's words, not mine. And then that's, that's, that's what we would hope the Israeli government would proceed, because that was our understanding. Yes? Diane Williams from Reuters. Thank you, Ambassador. Beyond completing the um, committee process that you just referred to, does the U.S. require the, that the Israeli elections of March 2nd be a thing of the past and the installation of a formal permanent government rather than a, take a, a caretaker government? Um, no, um, we don't think that the process will be completed before March 2nd. We, just, we have a, a sense in our own minds as to what's involved. The, uh, the amount of time it will take, the demands on the, uh, the committee members. I'm the only one who lives in Israel. There will have to be some visits and some tours. And we just don't think it's going to happen before March 2nd. But, um, but beyond that, um, the committee will, will proceed as quickly as it can. Does the administration require the installation of a formal 
government. We have not made that uh, that demand. No. Rafael Aren from the Times of Israel, Ambassador Friedman, um, if I may ask a question about the four-year time frame. Uh, it's question number one. Vision, um, the goal of that vision is to create a venture peace deal. Why is Israel allowed to take its spoils already right now when the Palestinians have a long list of requirements to fulfill before they get their part of the bargain? And in case the Palestinians do not come to the table, reject the deal, what is the vision for after these four years? Will Israel be allowed to um, apply sovereignty over the other parts, the parts that are not being turned into a Palestinian state? Thank you. So let me answer the second question uh, first, because it's a little bit shorter answer. Um, the answer is, uh, at the end of four years, if uh, there's no progress and no basis to extend that period of time, um, and that would be an extension that the parties themselves would have to agree to, then it would return to what it is today. It would be under, it, would, it's, it, it, it will continue to be under the administration of Colgate, and that will, that will continue uh, after the four-year period, and um, hopefully there'll be uh, another initiative, uh, but uh, I, we don't have a specific, there's no specific um, ev event that occurs when the four years expire. It's just, it, we, we will go back to where we are today as to that territory. Um, your, your first question, I think, is, is, is a good one and an important one. And what it does is it, it bridges the asymmetry between Israel and the Palestinians. It, this is a completely asymmetric um, relationship. Israel is a democracy. Uh, it, you can hold it to its word. Um, it has an, enormously, an enormous relationship with the United States on multiple levels, and, and that relationship is, is very solid. Um, it's, uh, um, it is in a position today to keep its part of the bargain. The Palestinians today are not in a position to keep any bargain. The Palestinians are not, um, are not united. Their government is not democratic. Their, um, their institutions are weak. Their uh, respect for the types of norms that we hold dear, whether it's uh, not just democracy, but human rights, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, are non-existent. And so you have to bridge that asymmetry by saying, well, if Israel's ready today, why shouldn't they get what they're agreeing to today? If the Palestinians are going to be ready in four years, well, then they can get what they get in four years. And, 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 and the only way, I think, to, to, um, to induce Israel to make the kind of commitments today that, um, that will have you know, ramifications for years to come is to provide them today with, with what they're entitled to in exchange for that. And so um, uh, I have no doubt that there would be, I have no doubt that Israel would never agree to a naked freeze of four years just on the possibility that the Palestinians might A, will be willing to negotiate, and B, achieve the milestones that, that this, we just couldn't have gotten there. And to us, it was very important to go to the Palestinians who were, as again, asymmetrically, they're not ready to say to them, look, um, you don't have to say yes or no today. Okay, we understand you're in a very difficult position. You're not united. You have numerous streams of, uh, of conflict that, that kind of weave throughout your, your, your body politic. So take your time, digest it, and you will not be penalized by the passage of time. If it takes you three or four years to get there, the territory that is earmarked for you, the integrity of that territorial opportunity will be preserved. Israel's never agreed to a, to a four-year four -year freeze. They agreed to a 10-month freeze, and it was, it was a complete waste of time, you know, at the demand of uh, Hillary Clinton. So, um, you know, it, in, in, the, in the simple course of... Uh, of uh, negotiations, it seemed like a, it seemed like a very fair trade for uh, for us, for the Palestinians, and for Israel. Morning. Well, first of all, um, there is no way that any president that preceded President Trump would recognize Israel's um, annexation of anything at any time. So, don't don't you know? Don't suggest that we are somehow being harsher than prior presidents. Look, the president uh, got up and he made a speech, and he said there will be a committee, and the committee will take go through a process. The process will not last very long, but we want to go through a process. Um, the politics seem to be emerging that uh, you know, people are saying, who cares about the process? Let's go do what we want. I can't stop that. I'm not suggesting that uh, the government of Israel shouldn't do whatever it wants to do, but I think people should know that if the, uh, if the 
president's uh, position is simply ignored, then we're not going to be in a position to, to go forward. We, we laid out the basis upon which we're prepared to go forward with this process. It's an enormous, it's an enormously beneficial to Israel. It's also enormously beneficial to Palestinians, to the region, to everyone else. But uh, I'll just, I'll say something which uh, I, I seem to say a lot in this country, uh, and I'm sure you guys, I'm sure I don't need to translate. Tafasta merubah lo tafasta. Okay, I mean, you know, a little bit of patience, you know, to go through a process, to do it right, is not something which we think is too much to ask for. Again, Israel, it's a sovereign nation, but it seemed to me, with, uh, with the news out that the cabinet was about to be pushed in a direction that was uh, potentially adverse to our view of the uh, process, at least let people know how, where we stand. It wasn't a threat, just let people know where we stand. Oh, I don't know. I think, look, I think, I don't know. I think we were, um, we might have had some, um, uh, some difference of view as to timing, but uh, in, in very short order, it became clear that we were all on the same page. Uh, Mr. Ambassador Ariel Kana from uh, Israel, I am following up about your, uh, uh, about your answer to, to Amichai. Um, uh, I would ask, um, if Netanyahu will take the step, let's say he will make a call to the president and tell him, I have to do it. In your opinion, what, uh, what will happen? I, I'm not going to speculate on, on, on that happening. I think it's very unlikely, but I wouldn't speculate. Uh, Melanie Phillips from the Times of London. Um, the plan is being presented as a break from the past, but once again, um, the Palestinians are being offered a reward uh, for their aggression. What therefore makes you think that they're not simply going to do what they've done every single time this has happened and simply walk away and leave Israel in basically the same position as it always was? Well, first of all, that, that's also what you've also uh, done is provide a partial answer to the question before as to why should Israel uh, get certain relief in advance of, uh, of the four-year period. It's because th there is the possibility that the Palestinians will do that, and the Palestinians should not be rewarded for either aggressive behavior or failure to engage. Um, I, I think we're, we're going to have to, I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, here to predict what the Palestinians will do. I am a firm believer in the Abba Ibn Mantra, about them never missing an opportunity to miss an opportunity. They may very well do the same here. The world's changed. The risks are, have changed. The neighborhood has changed. Um, there is uh, much greater visibility inside Palestinian society as to what awaits them outside their, their enclave uh, if, they can, um, if they can live in peace with their neighbors. Um, and um, Look, we think there ought to be, you know, we, we understand that they're moving towards elections and maybe, maybe there'll be a breakthroughs with that, with that process. Maybe some of the, uh, some of the friends of the uh, Palestinian uh, the local friends, if they're good friends, they're really good friends, they'll tell them they ought to sit down and engage on this. Um, but um, but we'll, uh, we're going to take it a step at a time. And as I said, one of, the, one of the key principles here is that this is a four-year option. And that's exactly because we expected very little in the short run. Uh, I'm Alan Baker, former ambassador, former legal advisor to the foreign ministry, presently the resident uh, lawyer, international lawyer here at the Jerusalem Center. Uh, my question is basically uh, from a lawyer to a lawyer, or from an ambassador to an ambassador. I'm a former lawyer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, a recovery so lawyer. So we're, we're yeah. quits. <laughs> uh, the... the the plan itself, uh, and your own words today, refer to deal, vision, plan, negotiated peace agreement, package of compromises, and you yourself said just a few minutes ago, pathway for Israeli sovereignty, pathway. My question uh, as a lawyer is, is it a, base, a basis for negotiation, or is it an interdependent package that needs to be agreed upon by both sides or as has been asked today is it something that's open for either side to take what he or she likes and implement immediately unilaterally or does does it all have to wait for for an, a negotiated uh, arrangement thank you 
Okay, so there's, there's um, I would look at it like this. I think there's, there's the deal, and then there's the deal within the deal. The deal itself, which is the, uh, which is the, the long document that, that, that you've read, is a uh, reasonably comprehensive. I mean, if one, if one were to actually sit down and negotiate every point, the, the document would grow probably tenfold. But it's a reasonably comprehensive outline of the terms upon which Israel and the Palestinians will exist two separate states side by side, a nation state of the Jewish people, a nation state of the Palestinian people, with overriding Israeli security control upon the borders that are laid out. Now, we think it's a basis for negotiation. It's certainly not something the United States would impose on either side. Uh, and to the extent that the parties negotiate different terms that lead to peace, we're obviously would be delighted to, uh, to see that happen. We have no pride of authorship. In terms of the deal within the deal, that is, um, that is the uh, agreement that we've reached with Israel, that if Israel maintains the, the, this optionality for four years, creates a four-year settlement freeze with regard to the 50% of Area C that's allocated to the Palestinians, if they, if they, if they, if they um, achieve that freeze, and agree to negotiate, use this plan as the basis for, ne for negotiation, which the Prime Minister has already done. He said that this plan will be the basis for negotiation. Then, upon, uh, upon Israel applying its laws to the territory that is earmarked for Israel within Judea and Samaria, that is uh, laid out on the map, upon them doing that pursuant to this committee process, which we just talked about, then the United States will recognize Israel's application of its laws. So you have the bigger deal, and then the, basically what I would refer to as the implementing agreement, which in order to keep this open for four years and not throw it back in a drawer, um, the United States has agreed to recognize Israel's application of laws uh, as, as you will, if you will, uh, I don't know if the right word is compensation, but as an inducement for Israel to keep the other, uh, the other territory open uh, for a future uh, agreement. I'm Jordana Miller, I-24 News and ABC News. I now have a question out of that answer. Mm -hmm. um, the deal within the deal, is that then not a deal that the United States is helping to mediate a negotiation? That's my first question. The second is you talked a lot today about security, borders, settlements. U.S. officials have said to the Palestinian side, come and negotiate. You also have said that. What specifically is up for negotiation? It doesn't sound like a lot is. Well, first of all, on the first point, um, the, um, the critical issue for years has been the, uh, the Palestinian uh, complaint that, that Israel is creating facts on the ground that over time um, deplete the possibility of a two-state solution. And in order for us, it was important to us to freeze that process, to freeze that depletion so that there would be, if the Palestinians come to the table and if they agree to a two-state solution along these lines, that the territory be there for them. If, um, if we didn't have that freeze in place, you know, four years from now or whenever, whatever the timeline would be, uh, this could be rendered academic because there frankly is no reason for Israel to, to, to discontinue its process. There's strong political support behind it. And, um, and, you know, the idea would be to keep that uh, option alive. Well, to keep that option alive, Israel's never agreed before to anything less than, anything more than 10 months, and it was a waste of time. So to agree to that type of a concession and recognizing the fact that the, the communities that, uh, that uh, we're talking about uh, highly unlikely to be going anywhere anyway. As we've already said, we're not, we don't support any notion of evacuation. These are large communities. There's hundreds of thousands of people that, that live in these communities. Um, so it seemed like a, a small price to pay to recognize uh, Israel's sovereignty over this territory in exchange for that, um, for that territorial freeze. This is not something we mediated. This is something that we obtained as a commitment from Israel in order to keep this option alive, and we were willing to recognize um, its sovereignty in exchange. So, uh, so just to yeah. confirm, there is no stage where the U.S. mediates these negotiations between the Israelis and Palestinians. You're leaving it to them to do it based on this outline? There, I think, I think you're, you might be conflating two different points. The, 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 the larger point is, is th 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 this, 
this fr the freeze and the recognition of sovereignty, neither one of them bring peace. Okay, they're interim steps to achieve territorial integrity for the Palestinians and to, in exchange for that, recognize Israel's sovereignty with regard to communities that are unlikely under any circumstance to be not be part of Israel in the future. So it would seem like a small price to pay in order to uh, obtain that, op that opportunity. The bigger deal, okay, now that you've, now that you've, you've created that option, the option is now alive. It's in place. It's four years. It's going to last for four years. The clock is ticking, but it's clicking, ticking very slowly. It's a lot of time. Now, can the Israelis and the Palestinians sit down in that environment and negotiate peace? And there we'll certainly be playing a mediating role if we're, if we're asked to. Uh, we, 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 we expect we will. Um, and, and so the bigger deal, we, we are continuing to engage as mediators, but um, ultimately it's up to the Israelis and the Palestinians through direct negotiations. Thank you. We're done with the questions. Right, Ruthie. Oh, Ruthie, oh, she, she, she's oh, waiting. Okay. She's waiting. So I've been pa waiting patiently. So patiently yeah. Ruthie Bloom from JNS and the Jerusalem Post. We've seen in Iran that there are many more voices now, um, pro-America, pro-Israel voices. They wouldn't step on the American flag and the Israeli flag recently. Is there anything uh, that you know behind the scenes to suggest that there is anybody in the Palestinian Authority? who is feeling that way and would like to switch this over to a desire for a state and not a desire to destroy Israel. Yeah, look, I wish I could uh, speak more candidly about this, and um, at this point I can't because uh, I need to preserve confidences, but um, we're, we're so encouraged by reactions we've gotten from within uh, the Palestinian community, from within the pro-Palestinian uh, uh, environment, from regional neighbors, um, this is, um, and this I think accomplishes two things. First of all, I think there, are, I think um, there, there are reason, there are reasonable minds out there. They exist. How, when, where they will come to the front? It's the same question in Iran. I mean, when will that happen? Iran won't last for that regime won't last forever. But you know, don't ask me to predict. You know how that all plays out. Um, there are people of good faith and goodwill out there that want to move forward with this. I have no doubt about that. There are people within the region. I think there are byproducts of this agreement that will um, help Israel uh, normalize with uh, a lot of its neighbors. And I think that, uh, in, in many ways, this puts us on a, on a very good path in, 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 a, in a multitude of directions. Um, stay tuned. Um, it's something that I think um, over the months ahead there'll be more visibility into. Thank you.